Nehemiah chapter 4. What we've seen all the way up to now, and we're doing this this summer, this is kind of our summer preaching series, and I usually take an Old Testament book and kind of tear it apart and put it back together again, and uh, we see that Nehemiah was told by a friend of his who had come from Jerusalem that the walls were destroyed and the people's hearts were broken in Jerusalem, and that created a burden in his heart. And if you read Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2, you see that he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he couldn't get it off of his mind and he didn't know what to do. And then he made a plan. That burden became uh, a vision and then it became a plan. And then he had to take some time and tell the king his plan. And you'll remember in Nehemiah chapter 2, the king says, you're really sad because Nehemiah was always around the king. He was the cupbearer or the taster for the king. And so he was always around the king. And the king says, you, you don't look happy. And I've never seen you unhappy. So what's going on with you? And uh, Nehemiah shot a prayer up to heaven and said, this must be my chance. And so he sat and he talked to the king and told them about Jerusalem, about how the walls were torn up and the people were discouraged and everything. And that God had put it on his heart to do something about that. And so that's Nehemiah chapter 2. That's really the first hurdle in terms of this whole plan that Nehemiah has to, has to deal with, is to get the king to buy in. And guess what? The king bought in, didn't he? He said, sure, you can go. How much time do you need? Take all the time you need. And uh, Nehemiah said, well, I not only need time, I need letters so that I can get to Jerusalem without getting arrested or thrown in jail. And he said, well, I'll get the letters from the governors. And uh, you can do that. And he says, what else do you need? And he says, well, I can just see Nehemiah going, well, I need some lumber. And uh, the king would probably look right at him and say, lumber? I know where you can get some lumber. And I'll tell you what, I'll even pay for the lumber for you to re rebuild this wall. And so that's Nehemiah chapter 2. And then we kind of scoot through chapter 3. And Ken mentioned this earlier that it's really kind of a, a genealogy of sorts about all the people that were involved in building the wall. And then you get to chapter four and you end up with another hurdle. Now, hurdles, when you have a plan, are unexpected obstacles that you've got to overcome in order to execute your plan. You ever had one of those where you had a plan and then all of a sudden you had an unexpected obstacle? Sure, we've all had those in our life. Uh, a couple years ago, I told Pam that I would take her, go down to Austin, and we'd see our son, Joel, and uh, then on the way back, we would stop in Waco and go to that place. <laughs> you know? You know the place in Waco? Uh, because Pam watches Fixer Upper, and it's Chip and Joanna, you know, and uh, some of you watch that show, and you know, and I don't really watch it. I watch it a little bit because I like Chip, because I think he's dumb. Uh, and, but, but he's not really dumb. He's really smart. And, uh, you know, they, they get these houses, and they're really rat hole kind of places, and they put all their energy and their money into this and somebody else's money, and they create these beautiful homes. But one of the things is that you can count on in almost every hour of Fixer Upper is a hurdle. Something doesn't work right. And usually it's Chip calling Joanna in and saying, you know how we said this was going to cost $130,000 to remodel? And she goes, yeah. Well, we've run into a problem and it's going to cost $160,000 to remodel. And she's going, well, you have the problem. And so he has to work all of that out. So it's a hurdle. Now, on this trip, we went down to Austin, spent a week down there in Austin, and then on our way back, we weren't even out of the city of Austin, and it was 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'm thinking, I've got, I got to, we got to stop in Waco. I promised that we would stop in Waco, and we would go to Magnolia, and I, I really need to have a good attitude about this, okay? I promised, I, and I was, I was really doing good with it, but we were only about a mile or so out of Austin when we hit a deer on the freeway and it smashed our car. And all of a sudden, I didn't have such a good attitude. And Pam wasn't saying anything because it was kind of scary. We were going 70 miles an hour and this deer just popped up and 
whacked it and we pulled over and we never could find the deer and now I don't have a car and I'm in Austin and all of that and all my mind is just going, what am I going to do? I want to get back home. I want to get home and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back home. We had great insurance and they took care of everything and as we're driving out of town, I thought, we're not going to be able to go to Waco. I mean, I, I want to be home tonight. I have to be home tonight. I'm tired and I, want, I don't want to stop three hours in Waco after spending all the morning at insurance companies and rental car places and all of that. And as we're driving out of town, Pam never said a word. She didn't say a word the whole morning. But as we're driving out of town, I'm thinking, I promised that we would go to Waco. And so we went to Waco, okay? And it was a big moment in my own maturity development, you know? <laughs> because I kept my promise and did what my wife really wanted to do. But I got to tell you, there was parts of that Waco experience that were not fun at all, okay? Like the crowds, like trying to park, okay? Like the 98% humidity, and then the downpour thunderstorm as you're standing in line, and you're trying to rush to that one building so you can get inside and, and all of that stuff. And I'm just thinking, whose idea was this? You know, and then eventually we got what we wanted, and Pam had a good time, and I survived it, and then we moved on back, back to Tulsa and went, went home. But there were hurdles all along the way. Well, this is what happens in Nehemiah's life, too. There are these hurdles that he's got to go through in order to get the wall built. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll just start reading there and kind of tear this apart and then put it back together again. It says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. And he ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these, and you ought to circle this word, feeble Jews doing, okay? They're weaklings. Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stones. Now there's a principle that's happening here in chapter 4 that I think we all need to get. It's right there in your notes at the top. That when the kingdom of God advances or attempts to advance, you can be sure that the kingdom of hell will oppose it at every turn. Every turn. The kingdom of hell does not want the kingdom of God to advance at all. And so here's this wall that's being rebuilt, and you remember that it wasn't really so much about the wall as it was about the people, you know, building the spirits of the people. They had been broken down and defeated and all kinds of things for decades and decades and decades. And so Nehemiah wants them to rebuild their spirit, and God wants to rebuild their spirit and give them this place. It's not just about rocks. But there were these hurdles, and there was this opposition. And that is true in almost any adventure that you take in life. There's always a hurdle, and there's always opposition. When you want to do something good for God, you can be sure that Satan doesn't, doesn't say, well, go on ahead and do good things for God. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, I'll catch you on the next turn. No, he's going to dig his heels in, and he's going to try to oppose you at every step of the way. And that's what it was about this wall. This wall was not just about rocks and security. It was really about hope. The people didn't have any hope. They'd been beaten down for so long. And yet here's God saying, go build that wall and that'll be a confidence booster for you. This was about all of the people in Jerusalem becoming united around one vision. Okay? It's what I call alignment. Okay? And businesses need to be aligned Homes need to be aligned, marriages need to be aligned, and churches need to be aligned behind one vision. And that's what the vision was here. It was to rebuild this wall, to have security and hope, and these people were going to see that they could align themselves behind Nehemiah and the vision, and it would give them organizational strength. 
And that's what they were after. And then after decades and decades of being beaten down, all of a sudden, the, the Jews in Jerusalem had an opportunity for a win. A win. Now, I coached basketball when I was in college, and uh, uh, I, t- I had an a intramural team. And uh, I was a player coach, and uh, uh, we had a bunch of guys that wanted to play basketball. And I would played in college and high school and everything, and so I thought, well, I can coach this team, and so I'm going to coach them. And we called ourselves the robes, and we wore our robes in warm-ups every game. Okay, and this was at Ozark Christian College, and we all had robes, and we wore them, and everybody made fun of us, and we did not win a game. Okay, we went winless. Okay, not much of a coach. Okay, really at all, but you know it was hard to not win any games. Okay, you always want to have some win somewhere that you can celebrate, and for the people in Jerusalem, this wall was going to be the opportunity for them to celebrate. The win. Now, uh, one guy calls Sanballat the great distractor. And I like that because he's sitting off there and he's angry about this wall and he begins to ridicule them and criticize them and he calls them feeble and he says they're not going to finish. They can't bring those stones back to life. And then his buddy Tobiah says, hey, listen, you, even a fox, a little tiny fox get on this wall and would break it all down. So there's this criticism going on, and it's, it's really hard. In chapter 2, verse 10, we read, He and Tobiah were disturbed by the reports that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Jews. Bottom line, that's what it was about, was they were wanting to allow the Jews to have a better life. And here was Tobiah and Sanballat saying, No, let's don't do that at all. So in your notes there, one of the things that I say, and it's toward the front there, and you can fill this in, is, is that chronic opponents to progress love the status quo. Chronic opponents to progress love the status quo. And there are people like that everywhere. They're in churches, they're in businesses, they're in homes. Okay, they don't want things to change at all. But the bottom line is, is they want the status quo and they like the status quo. And if the status quo doesn't rule in their life or in a particular project or maybe in a church, then all of a sudden they're criticizing all the changes and they don't like the changes at all. So Pam and I went to the North American Christian Convention last week in Indianapolis And uh, what used to be a convention that would have 10, 12, 15,000 people at it had 4,000 people at it this year in Indianapolis, which is really a hotbed of Christian churches. I mean, they come from all over in that part of the country, and nobody is coming to this convention anymore. And so the convention, every main session had a piece of it about how they were going to change the convention, how they were going to zero in on younger leaders in the church, how they were going to move it out of the summer and move it into the fall, and it was going to have a different focus. It was going to be more 21st century. And every single session, there was somebody up on that stage saying, things are going to change. And you could feel the chill. You could feel kind of the, what do you mean he's going to change? We've had this convention since 1926. And uh, you're going to change it? Yeah. And one guy got up there and said, if we don't change it, it dies. Five years from now, this convention isn't here. You see, the status quo is the enemy of progress in many ways. And many people who are tied to uh, criticizing the, the, the projects that go on that can move the kingdom of God forward, often status quo is their best friend. Now, for Stan Ballot, it was no doubt a power thing for him. He had the Jews under his thumb. He was a governor, and he was not going to give up and, without a fight here at all. He wasn't going to allow them to get strong. And this pr- directly opposed God and his kingdom. I want you to think with me for just a second about the kingdom of God in your life. You realize that the kingdom of God in your life and in your church looks forward, not just back. And when you look forward, you see change coming. It makes you nervous, that's for sure. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that wants to make things better for his people. 
The kingdom of God believes in the positive impact of progress. And progress is important. But in Nehemiah 4.1, we read, Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, and he became very angry and greatly incensed. Not just disturbed like he was in chapter 2, but now he is angry. Moving to the point of action, he is going to start a battle against these people that are building this wall around uh, Jerusalem. We learned a couple things right off the bat here in this chapter. Number one, you don't have to go look for opposition. It'll find you, right? I mean, that's true, and you can, you can look in your life, and you can kind of see uh, different things where criticism and uh, hatefulness and negative thinking, it, it will find you when you're trying to move forward in your life. It's just true, There's so many examples of God-ordained projects and movements that never sought out trouble, but ended up always finding trouble, or trouble found them. And you can read those throughout the Bible. You can talk about Moses and getting the people out of Egypt. You can talk about Job and Daniel and Elijah and Abraham and Esther. And you can talk about New Testament people who always ran into these hurdles and ran into opposition. Opposition is real in our life. Persecution is real in our life if we really believe what the Bible says. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says that all those who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, will be persecuted. It's a promise. You're going to go through persecution. You're going to go through opposition in your life when you want to do something for God. If you stand for Jesus at school this year and, uh, and you really make a stand for him and you want people to know that you're a Christian, you're going to run into opposition, young people. You're going to run into people who say you can't do that. I read about a pastor this week who went to a football camp in Arkansas, and he's being called out by the ACLU because he led a prayer at this football camp. He said, I just wanted to pray with the football players. And all of a sudden, he's being splashed all over the news and everything because there's this criticism and there's this opposition. And basically, it's a group out of Wisconsin that is saying, you can't do that. You can't bring God into the schools. Well, let me tell you something. For every one of you that are in the schools, God is in that school. And for every one of us in our workplaces, in our home, we don't need to have big programs and big signs and everything. We have God living inside of us, and so God is there. And we don't need to be the kinds of people that shriek back and say, well, I don't want to get criticized. You're going to get criticized. But if you take a stand for Jesus anywhere, you're going to get criticized. That's just the way it is. It's the way it was in the, in the time of Nehemiah as well. If you get into government and you stand for Christ, and we just had the big elections here the last few weeks, and you know we had all kinds of things that happened with that. But if you stand for Christ in government, you're going to get opposed and you're going to get criticized. You just are. It's how it works. And if you try to help somebody who has a need, believe it or not, this happens even in the church. If you try to help somebody who has a need, there might be somebody standing off to the side with their arms crossed like this saying, ah, I don't think you probably should help them. Yeah, you probably shouldn't spend that kind of money. You don't want to get involved in this. You're, you're being dumb in some way. You need to check it out more. The other day in Indianapolis, we'll walk by a guy and he was sitting on the side of the street and there, there wasn't a lot of homeless people, but this guy, we just walked by, Pam and I did, and I don't know what it was. It was the spirit of God, I think, is really what it was. I just felt like I needed to go back and give him some money and I don't do that at all. So I walked back and walked up to him and said, uh, here, and I handed him a $20 bill, and I said, I want you to have this. And he's like, oh, man, thank you so much. But it was, it was, I was being led by God in that moment. It's a very unusual thing for me to do that, and I just decided to do it. I told Pam, I said, keep walking, I'll catch up with you. And, uh, and we did it. I don't know what he did with that $20. I don't know that it's really my place to know what he did with that $20, My place is to listen to the Spirit when the Spirit says do something, to do it. Amen? That's the way we should be. And that's the way Nehemiah was. Opposition almost always starts with criticism. People picking at us. 
And in Nehemiah's case, that is exactly what was happening. They, those guys were being nitpicky, and they were criticizing him and ridiculing the people. And those are tools that Satan uses to shake the confidence of somebody that's on a project. They criticized the character of the builders. They criticized their ability. They questioned their commitment to finish the project. Tobiah called the entire workforce incompetent. Even a lazy fox could break down this wall here. Why was that such an effective place for Tobiah and Sanballat to start? Because these people had been beaten up for generations, and they thought, you know, if we just say the right thing, they'll go home and they'll forget about it. But look at Nehemiah's response, verse 4. Just kind of out of the blue, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. You know who Nehemiah talked to? He didn't talk to Sanballat or Tobiah. He talked to his God. And he put it in the hands of his God. And when you are criticized and ridiculed because you're taking on something that God is calling you to do and somebody's making a big deal about it, can I encourage you to make sure that the first person you go to is God? Go to God and say a simple prayer. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised being criticized, whatever it is. And with that prayer, then it says in verse 6 that we rebuilt the wall until all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all of their heart. My son-in-law coaches basketball over in Bixby and uh, in the playoffs this last year. They played uh, one of the local teams here in, in the city, really, really, really good team. And the first quarter, they were only down by five points. And I, I'm sitting up in the stands thinking, this is a miracle, okay? Because they're going to get creamed. And in the second quarter, in the space of about three minutes, it went from five points to 25 points. And by halftime, they were down by like 30 points. And I thought, you know, this is where Nathaniel is going to really earn his coaching, is going into that locker room and, telling, and getting those kids to come back out and play hard in the second half. Halftime's kind of a funky thing, isn't it? I mean, here it is, halftime for rebuilding the wall, and it says the people worked with all of their hearts, but halftime also can be one of those crossroads in a project where you look at it and you go, I'm only half done. You ever done a home project like that? Maybe you've done some, some uh, you know, wallpapering or replacing floors or something like that, and you look at it and you think, I'm only half done. Oh, I wish I was completely done. You know, well, that's where they were, and they worked with all of their heart, but because they were working with all of their heart, that only ratcheted up Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites in verse 7, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead. They didn't just walk away at all, and the gaps were being closed, and they were very angry. Verse 8, they all plotted together to come up and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Okay? So here they are. They're building. Things are going pretty well. They're even getting through halftime, sort of. And, uh, and the enemy says, okay, now we're going to go to war. We're going to come in, and we're going to kill a bunch of you, and we'll knock this down. And you know what happens? They just keep plugging away. Just keep plugging away. You know, that's one of the secrets of life, isn't it? Just to put one foot in front of the other and just keep moving forward. And for a lot of us, when we stop and we don't move forward, then we kind of grind to a halt and we don't make any progress. And some days my steps are just little tiny steps. Some days they're giant steps. But I'm committed to taking a step, one step along the way. In 2006, I had a stroke, and uh, uh, it affected my speech, it affected my balance, it affected a bunch of different things, and one of the things that the doctors told me is I needed to get out and walk, but it was kind of hard to walk because I was running into walls, is what I was doing. 
And so I really concentrated on just taking one step, one step forward, step by step by step. And that's how we live life. That's how we live the life of faith. That's how they built the wall, one day after the other, after the other, doing the right thing. And even though Tobiah would say even a lazy fox could tear down this wall, the fact is is the Jews had been beaten down for so long that all they had to do was just take one step. And that's what we call rebuilding. And sometimes we've got to rebuild a marriage. And when we rebuild a marriage, we just take one step. It doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't all get better today. But over the course of time, if a husband and wife will take the right steps, they can rebuild their marriage. Even if it's been uh, hurt and harmed through betrayal, they can rebuild it. Sometimes you've got to rebuild in the church. Sometimes you've got to respond and take steps. And uh, we've been in that kind of a mode for a little bit where we, we've rebuilt and we're rebuilding along the way. And you know what? It's just little steps. It's not big blow up the place and say, we're going to have this big thing happen. We're just taking little steps of faithfulness and commitment to Jesus. And you know what? We're making progress. You know that is true in your businesses as well. And so Nehemiah has a couple things that he does. Number one, he prays to God. That's in your notes there. You can, how did Nehemiah handle, how to handle opposition? He prays to God, and we looked at that earlier. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And those insults were wounding. They, they wounded them. But with that, they continued to build the wall. To the point that verse 6 describes that they had built it to half their height. They were determined that they were going to move forward on this wall. And then it says that they got their eyes off of God and ended up putting their eyes on the rubble around them. Do you see that in verse 10? Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. That's why I said earlier that Vacation Bible School is an all-hands-on-deck event in this church. Because if you only have four or five people doing Vacation Bible School, they're worn out and ground into the ground. But if everybody in the body of Christ will come together and minister to those kids, you may do something that's really insignificant in your eyes, but you're being part of the team that is helping people. If everybody would do that and stick their hands in there and say, I want to be a part of this team. I want to do what I can. I'll do it before, after, during the week, whatever I need to do. That's how you build up people and you make progress in your life. And that's what God wants us to do. And so they saw the rubble. But Nehemiah said, let's slow down and let's Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray first. And Le- Nehemiah's leadership was being tested like never before. And so the next thing he did, he not only prayed, but then he remembered. And Ken brought this out. I thought this was really good in verse 14. It says there that after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Don't keep your eyes on the enemy. Instead, remember the what? The Lord who is great and awesome, okay? Keep your eyes focused on God in your marriage, in your home, in your church, in your business. Don't get overwhelmed with all the rubble around you. Instead, put your eyes on the one who towers over the wall in your life and says, I'll help you rebuild it. And that's, that is faith building for us, even as a church, Nehemiah remembered, and it was awesome that he did that. And you've got a story to tell, and you ought to tell your story about how God's working in your life. I read yesterday in some time that I had in the morning from Mark chapter 5 about the demon-possessed man across from the lake, and, and Jesus cast those demons into the pigs, you remember, and they went down and drowned and all that. And what was interesting was, is the demon-possessed man went back to Jesus and said, hey, I am free. I'm loose of all these chains. This is awesome. I want to go with you. I'll go wherever you are, and I'll tell my story wherever you go. I want to be on a traveling team with Jesus. And you know what Jesus said? 
No. Go back home. Go back to your people and tell them your story. You got a story. And you ought to be quick to tell your people your story. Rather than trying to get involved in some big giant thing, just have conversations with people about the difference Jesus makes in your life. And you'd be amazed at how people will latch on to that. I was thinking uh, yesterday about a uh, little trip that Pam and I took. We went to Baptist Integris Hospital to see Jody Marsh. Now, most of you will know Jody. She's in her middle 80s. She was at a subway about a month ago, and she fell flat on her face, broke her neck, her back. She's had a really tough month. And I've gone up and visited her a couple times. And so Pam and I said, well, we're going to go visit her. And so I texted her, and I said, hey, we're going to come up and visit you. And, you know, I thought, well, she'll be glad for that. Well, they sent her home yesterday. And so she sent a note back, said, I'm, I'm home. And I thought, well, okay, if, you, if you've been home, it means you've been out, you're probably exhausted, your daughter's probably exhausted. So I told her, I said, we'll come see you Monday or Tuesday. We'll just do it that way, and it'll be better. Jody wrote this back to me. She said, I am believing for miracles. God's mission for me has ever been expanded through the hospital crew, my neighborhood, and church family. There has been an amazing revelation of how God works in, my, in his strange ways, his wonders to perform. And I thought, wow. You know, sometimes you go visit people in the hospital, and it ends up being that they visited you. You know? I mean, it just lifts your spirits. And that's the way Jody is. It's, we've got several people like that. But she puts that in a text, and I just thought, wow, what a story to tell. And some of you are so good at telling your story about Jesus in your life, in your faith. Don't be afraid to tell people what God has done and what you believe God will do in the future for you. It's all part of your story. The last thing that I tell you about Nehemiah out of chapter 4 is he revised his plan. He revised his plan. And this goes back to this idea of being flexible, okay? I was thinking this morning when I saw the bulletin, I was thinking, oh, no, what are we going to do? And I thought, well, I, I got a plan. I can revise my plan a little bit. I thought about two weeks ago when the electricity went off. And, well, let's get a plan, and so we got the plan over there in the worship center. And what was interesting was that I sit in my office scribbling down some notes to talk to you guys about, about power, and I had my door open, and the door to the office was open, and I heard the electricity come on, and immediately I heard stacks of chairs starting to go up. And I ran down there, and a couple of you saw me do this. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to stick to the plan. We're going to have church in there today. And, of course, like 30 seconds later, the electricity went off again. And I was so glad for that. You know, one of the real gifts that you can bring to people in your life, in your home, and in your church is the ability to be flexible, to go with it, and then to let God use that flexibility for his glory and his power in our life. And when you do that, that's what Nehemiah did. It says there in verse 13, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, Don't be afraid of them. And then in verse 15, When our enemies heard that we were well aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to do his own work. Because they were flexible. And it says in verse 16, From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armors. And the story just continues in verse 19. Then I said to the nobles, officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Isn't that awesome? That is a leader, okay? That's a leader that says, we're going to get this done, and we're going to have to be flexible and change things up a little bit, but it's okay. And in verse 21, he says, so we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And at that time, I said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards. 
by night and workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men or the guards with me took off our clothes. Each one had his weapon, even when he went for water. We're going to get this done. But you got to be flexible. And uh, sometimes church people can be the most inflexible people, you know. And uh, yet we need to be flexible. We need to go with it and let God lead us in some really cool ways. Somebody said, you can plan all you want, but be adaptable. And I think that is truth. Interesting story about Sam Walton. Sam Walton, of course, was the guy that started all the Walmart stores and everything. I was reading a little bit about him this last week, and uh, he had a vision for his stores. And the vision was summed up this way. I want to provide value to my customers in order to make their lives better. I want to provide value to my customers in order to make their lives better. But he was notorious for making plans and then changing them at the last minute. He was super flexible. And he would abandon strategies and start down another trail. And people would look at him and say, you're crazy. And his son, Jim, said, we all snickered at some writers who viewed dad as this grand strategist who intuitively developed complex plans and implemented them with precision. What they didn't know was is that dad thrived on change and no decision was ever sacred. If you read much of the story about Walmart, you'll see that comes out in a lot of ways. So when your plans don't play out the way that you set them, that's, that's not the opportunity to ditch the vision. That's an opportunity to stay close to the vision because the vision is still king, but you may have to think about a different way to get there. And that's being flexible. So seek out that vision Be the kind of person that is convinced that this is the right vision for you in your life or in the church or whatever it is, and go for it. And when obstacles come your way, be flexible. Because only the vision is sacred. And for Nehemiah, it was, I'm going to rebuild this wall. Would you stand, please? A lot to think about in there. And I hope you'll remember that Nehemiah prayed and he remembered, and then he revised the plan. And that was uh, his heart for the people that he led. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for Nehemiah and the lessons that he teaches us about leadership in the church, but also in our personal lives. I thank you, God, for all the opportunities that you give me and others in this room to grow and to remember that Your will is the will that we want done. And yes, we may have steps and plans that we think, yeah, this is how it's going to go. But you guide those steps. And you shape us. And you use us. Because ultimately, it is your vision for us and for your church that is sacred in the kingdom of God. Pray that you would speak to us now as we sing this song and remind us of the great tools that Nehemiah gives us to deal with opposition in our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.